you know, ob the, the obvious things, uh, innate musicality, um, a, a love for what they're doing. Um, I think a certain capacity to, um, to entertain the idea of change. You know, because usually with voice, you're, you're so often, when you, when you get a voice student, you're maybe the first teacher they've ever had and you have to really establish all sorts of new habits. They may have sung very naturally and very beautifully, but you have to, to some degree, make conscious what has been unconscious. In other cases, there's, there's a gift for music, but the voice is kind of embryonic when it comes in, and you have to kind of... Uh, a colleague of mine used to say, you can't make a voice, you can only release a voice, and I thought that was an interesting formulation that she had, you know, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to to find what's really within and and uh, remove the encumbrances of it so it speaks directly and without uh, entanglements uh, through music to its prospective audience. So I look for um, actually in young people today I look for a certain level of fitness of just sheer physical fitness and and body awareness because if they have none of that that's very difficult to create and it's less and less something that you can take for granted because uh, childhood is not nearly as physical as it used to be. Life isn't as physical as it used to be. So the, the whole idea that uh, with singing you're dealing with a, an integrated uh, mind-body activity. It has to be conceptualized in the mind but then the body is the means of execution. So those two things have to speak to one another and uh, the unifying factor, of course, is breathing, because breathing is involuntary when we don't think about it. But in the case of singing, it has to be organized and made voluntary so that that actually is the means by which the brain and the body can work together in, in close uh, proximity or, or in synchronicis synchronicity. So um, I, I look for, um, I suppose, just in an excellent voice is and a superb voice you encounter every once in a while just a great natural gift for singing but more important to me is really the ear because if you don't hear it you don't sing it and there's there's no intermedi intermediary between the the ear and the voice if 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 you don't have a good ear you'll you'll not be able to reproduce complex uh, melodic structures so that i look for uh, first and foremost, and, and a joy in, in the, the, the singing act, and just a, a certain physical and sensual delight in the feel that uh, all of that sort of resonance and ring produces in your body, and uh, maybe just the feel of, of, of a good breath, and uh, just a certain physicality. I look for all of those things. A good appearance doesn't hurt either, you know. I think anybody that, that goes into the performing arts has to deal with that issue of rejection. It's, it just is always there, you know, so I just had a lesson before I came in today, uh, an older student who went through undergraduate school here and he's 32 and he's really very good. He's a, a light tenor and he looks good and he sounds good and he's a wonderful musician and it's, it's music when he sings. and. He said, well, you know, I've just gotten around to thinking that I really am going to do this. He said, you know, for every, every two jobs you get, you get ten rejections. And that's really true. I mean, it, and it begins right at that very first audition situation. I think you have to, um, you know, I'm, I've been interested always in watching that um, Inside the Actors Studio series of interviews because despite the, the structure of the interview, which is pretty rigid sometimes, uh, generally there are things that are said that are, that are highly interesting for anybody who's going to go on the stage in any capacity. And uh, I think it might have been Alec Baldwin who said, you know, an audition is an opportunity to perform. It's, it's just another chance to perform. And, you know, when you get right down to it, there's, it's, it's all failure, really. You know, you could view it that way, that every time you sing, something's going to be wrong. Every time you get up on stage, something won't go quite right. That beautiful plan of 100% that you were going to get, maybe you, you're lucky if you get 60% of what you set out to do. So I think that element in, in preparing somebody for an audition needs to happen early on. 
that there is this sense of play that informs the instructional process and the process of practice, and then that, that spirit of, of experimentation and play goes also into the, to the performance and to the audition. Of course, you, don't, you, you leave as little to chance as possible. You know, you, you, you know your piece you know, thoroughly, you know where, where all of the words go, how they're pronounced, where all of the rests are, you know the harmonics under you, you you've played it, you've done it with a good pianist and with a lousy one, you know, that I could name everything that you could possibly do. And you pick pieces that suit you to the ground. You know, the repertoire is so vast, there's utterly no reason to go in and audition with a piece that you don't like. Uh, that because choose another piece, you know, but you, you should have pieces that, um, that speak to your strengths rather than to your weaknesses. I mean, there are a lot of people that get up and sing pieces because they think they should, whereas if they had shown what they could do rather than what they can't do, they'd get the job. And there are a lot of ways of doing that, and that takes, it takes guidance. I mean, nobody, I think, the really super students, you know, the really superb ones that have career written all over them, kind of know that from the start. They know what suits them and they know where they're comfortable and they won't put themselves in a situation where they're uncomfortable. But most of us, and I was one of those, I had, it took me a while to figure out what suited me and what didn't and uh, how, to, how to choose things that would show a lot of palette, you know, not palette as in that palette, but painterly palette that I could show lots of different colors and lots of different things that I could do. And I ended up, you know, then starting to to win contests and auditions and was able to begin working. You can tell sometimes by how they comport themselves what it's going to be. Other times it's a surprise. The, the farther they are in, in lessons and in trade, the more you can tell from just how they walk on the stage. Right at the beginning, maybe not so much. This is something that you do for everybody, but um, you treat them with respect. You know, that's, I think, the first thing that, that uh, I, um, I think that you have to create maybe with somebody who is already taught and is already farther along in career, they have more to lose by submitting themselves to you. You know, they, they already have an idea kind of how things should be. So it's very important for you to, uh, to affirm how they are and to, to honor the fact that they have come to you and, and uh, submitted themselves to you for advice. And um, you need to create within the studio environment a feeling of safety, you know, a feeling that, that they can take risks in there, that they don't have to show you everything that they have done or they, they are capable of doing, but that it's just sort of, you give them credit and, and you begin kind of playfully with them and, and uh, treat them at first with a certain amount of deference and then you see how willing they are uh, in the course of that to, to make changes. And sometimes, you know, I might want to ask them to make substantive changes just in the whole way that they, um, if, if they're doing something that I think is basically unhealthy for them, I will tell them. You know, if they're, they're doing what I call in the, in, in the trade, singing a sound rather than singing words, you know, if they're just putting out a sort of, sort of generic sound product, I try to get around to that in a, uh, sometimes very directly, but I have to ascertain whether they're going to be able to receive it or not. And if I see that they're not going to be able to receive it, then I have to kind of <laughs> go around that way a little bit and see if I can, can go in another way. And then, you know, usually it, it establishes itself pretty, pretty quickly um, what they're there for and, and how willing they are to, to take what you have to say. And the first few times I never give it the hard sell very much. I, I try to, to just say, well, you know, to agree with a lot of what they've, what they, to try to, to reach a consensus rather than to show them that they're on the, because you can always reach a consensus about some things, the necessity to take a good breath and usually the necessity to pronounce well and singing in tune and not having a wobble and certain basic things like that are, are, are not uh, open to dispute. But 
Then beyond that, if you have the sense that what they're doing or they're coming from a very different direction from you, you have to tread quite carefully there because you don't want to in any way uh, diss their training or what they are, but you might just suggest, uh, I find myself lots of times suggesting a different way that they could do something. Or I'll just say, well, you might want to try introducing this idea in this way. And uh, then I'll usually just give them very simple exercises you know, just to, to kind of identify you know, if, if, if I think that their, their technique, for instance, is really tension-based, uh, that's something that I would want to move right in on. And, and, uh, and you just have to see how receptive they are. I actually owe some of this to a man named Wes Wesley Balk, who for years um, had the Minnesota Opera, and he developed a whole way of dealing. He was a stage director and developed an entire methodology of dealing with singers because he felt that flow was so important, that every time you stopped a rehearsal, it was basically kind of injurious to the product that you were trying to get out, that every, every time that then you would have to overcome the inertia of stopping and starting up again, and that that's an energy, and uh, you know, it's sort of like, <laughs> and you do that enough with a singer, and it really tends to kind of tire you out vocally. And so he found ways of, of doing hand signals that would affirm his sig uh, singers as they were working. And, you know, for instance, I remember some of them. He, I knew him fairly well, and uh, he came down here and gave workshops about 15, 20 years ago. And this meant yes and something.